Well, well, well. Let's get started. Another race for the world's greatest driver, Juan Manuel Fangio. Former world champion Jim Clark leapt into the lead. That's Clark's Lotus going like a bomb. And James Hunt is the world champion by just one single point. By being a racing driver, you are under risk all the time. And if you no longer go for a gap that exists, you're no longer a racing driver. And that is Michael Schumacher ahead, the world champion. To become a four-time world champion, Sebastian Vettel, Lewis Hamilton, champion of the world. That's for all the kids out there who dream the impossible. Max Verstappen, for the first time ever, is champion of the world. <laughs> Hello and welcome to episode 38 of F1 in Review, the episode in the hour where we discuss the Brazilian Grand Prix and look forward to the season's finale in Abu Dhabi. I'm Tom Claiborne and I'm joined by Tristan Fancourt and Angus Gallagher. A reminder that you can follow myself and Tristan individually on Twitter as well as the F1 in Review account where these episodes are posted once they've gone out live on River Radio and also via the uh, podcast provider of your choice, be that Podfollow, Spotify, Apple Music, Apple Podcasts, you know the drill. So first of all, we start off with Mercedes. The Silver Arrows qualified in P3 and P8. They rose to P1 and P2 after the sprint. And that's exactly how they finished this weekend with uh, George Russell taking his first ever F1 win and Lewis Hamilton pushing him all the way, really. The first time that Mercedes has secured a 1-2 this season and indeed you'd have to go all the way back to the Tuscan Grand Prix of 2020 for the last time the constructor pulled this off in a Grand Prix weekend. So first question to you all, in terms terms of how we've discussed, we've debated, we've questioned whether Mercedes could win a race this season. They've done it. They've done it in style. What do you make of it all? Oh, well, I didn't expect it. I must admit, I, uh, I've been taken aback ever so slightly by the, the pace that Mercedes had at the weekend, which was, I don't know, I, I just didn't expect it. And I think that is the uh, main takeaway, really. This was, I mean, brilliant. It was brilliant. What a what a race. What a race weekend, I should say, really, because mm. it all really kicked off on Friday with some excellent qualifying. And I, I'm actually in favour of Friday qualifying. I quite like the fact that, you know, one finishes work. Well, I, in my case and my time zone, your time zone may vary, given that we do have listeners around the world. But for me, I finish work. I then sit down, you know, eat dinner, watch the watch the qualifying, and then you've got the rest of the, the weekend of, of excitement after that. I don't know. I don't, don't get the same sort of excitement with the free practice. And the, don't get me wrong, I mean, free practice is, is nice, and I, I tune into it as a sort of a background thing. But there is a certainly an extra drama from qualifying. And, you know, for, and there was a certain excitement on, on Friday, um, which clearly got completely blown out of the water by the fact that a certain Kevin Magnussen um, was on pole position, <laughs> which was just nuts. And uh, that was fantastic. But, you know, I think Mercedes on the Friday sort of, we you know, didn't really see them coming, given that they qualified third and third and eighth. And then when we get into the sprint race over the longer period of time, they managed to get up to, to one and two once the penalties have been taken into account and Paul Carlos Sainz had to make way and um, with his with his grid penalty which allowed Russell and Hamilton to be on the on the front row but if you'd asked me then who's going to win it I would have said oh I think it's going to be Max Verstappen but alas the uh, the gods intervened and Max and Hamilton you know had this I think of quite a I th- I'd say quite a usual crash for them I looked at it, I was like, oh, not again, not again. <laughs> Every single time those two are racing, they um, seem to come together. And to be honest, I found it a little bit of a tricky one to, to judge, I think. Um, and I think we'll talk about this a bit later. Um, but George, I think the real hero of the weekend was just George Russell. Absolutely mega. Apart from Kevin Magnussen, he's the other hero. But the heroes in different ways. George Russell was really the hero on Sunday um, and during the sprint, if we're, if we're going to be honest. He just had the pace, had, I think, the just the start and the knowledge to, to not, I don't know, not get in his own head, perhaps, which we think he's done before. You know, the fact that there was a whole load of drama going on behind him, 
absolutely helped him for sure. But doing things like controlling the safety car, controlling the pace, all that sort of stuff. I mean, it demonstrated what he could do. And it's just nuts to think about the fact that you know he has managed to take a win for Mercedes in a year in which none of us were predicting they would, I don't know, get anywhere close to win. I thought that the best they'd get was second and that's it. But to drive home a 1-2, it sort of had McLaren feelings actually about it when McLaren was able to take their 1-2 in Monza. I, and, you know, yes, this was certainly a, I would say, slightly less dramatic race than the Monza. But to, we have to be fair to him. They managed to hold back Red Bull. They managed to hold back the Ferraris. And, you know, that's let's not beat around the bush. The fact that Charles Leclerc and Max Verstappen had, you know, had some almighty comebacks. Leclerc especially. But we can't take it away from them. Everyone in Mercedes, I think, has worked extra hard to secure that win. I think we all know that Hamilton might not complete his streak for a win in every um, season. But I don't think Hamilton will mind that much, given what it meant to George. Just the emotion, the raw emotion that George had crying on the podium um, and in the interviews. I think I think Lewis will be all right with that. And I think we kind of are all too. I just hope the momentum mm. continues. What a what a moment! So many good moments this weekend, which is why I'm furious with myself that I ended up with plans and I missed it all. <laughs> um, but at the same time, at the same time, it's just such a feel good weekend. We'll go we'll go on to um, some of the many other good results, like the shock pole for Haas and Magnussen, the great fight backs from the likes of the Alpines, uh, the battles, the there's controversy as well, a sprint race which. I'll bite my tongue was actually pretty good um dare i say it but the the moment of the weekend for me yeah has to be it's tight between Haas's pole and russell's win but i think it's just finally russell breaking his duck um after not that it was overdue but it's still, it feels overdue simply because we may remember it seemed it seems like yesterday but it's two years ago now that race in bahrain where he steps into the mercedes for one race came within five thousandths of a second of pole and then led most of the race before it got taken away from him, not once but twice. That was two years ago now, and that arguably would have been, had it gone the right way, his first win, having stepped up to the senior team on a one-off appearance. So that's why it kind of feels overdue. At the same time, because Mercedes has been struggling this year compared to previous years, it's not like we've been eking George to get his first win all year. Um, he's been consistent with his results and he's had good points finishes across the year but there hasn't been there's only been a couple of occasions maybe uh Zandvoort where Mercedes were quick and they had the they had the um until the end had the advantage on strategy and also in Hungary where Russell took pole and was competitive for most of the race those are maybe the only two other occasions where you might think ah oh, there's a victory chance gone there because generally, Mercedes just haven't been as quick and chances for victories have been few and far between. But this was his chance. He drove not the perfect weekend, lest we forget he spun off in qualifying, um, which ironically benefited him because he spun off just as it started to rain and nobody could improve their time to get past him. And then winning the sprint on Saturday and then on Sunday, a fantastic drive from him. Cool, calm and collected. Um, so cool and calm and collected that his team didn't want to tell him that he had like a water leak for about half the race because they feared it might distract mm. him. They only told him after the end when he was perhaps only five laps from uh, DNFing from not finishing the race. But overall, he resisted pressure from Hamilton. Other things happened behind him like Verstappen and Leclerc were incidents that ended that meant they self-imploded a bit. Perez was off it. And science wasn't really too much of a threat. So it was only really Hamilton coming back through the field that was a threat to Russell. But he managed to hold off that threat and take that first win in his 81st race start, which seems like quite a lot. But at the same time, I think that based on the experience he's had this year with the Mercedes, it perhaps wasn't as overdue as we like to think. But it was a wonderful moment. The first British uh, 1-2 since 2010 Canada, when that was mm. Hamilton and Jensen Button. Um, Mercedes first one two in two mm. years. So last year they never they didn't get a single one two with Bottas as the second driver. So they haven't had a one two in two years. So a great milestone for the team as well. 
and also it shows you i think about there was an image circulating around a lot which has been a lot this year but more so after this race of it's about from about 15 years ago and it's a nine or ten year old george russell wearing a lewis hamilton uh fan kit and he's standing next to lewis hamilton when hamilton was driving from mclaren there's a picture at the mclaren's woking base and 10 to 15 years later or however, however long it is they're teammates mm. so it shows you dreams can come true and George Russell's dream certainly came true the emotion was clear on the team radio and after the race um, a momentous occasion and as British fans we hope this leads to him kick on, kicking on um, and also it makes me think I was thinking in my head uh, recently who would be out of the, ne- the drives on the grid who would be the next to break their victory duck and I was thinking it would be either Russell or Norris um, and Norris uh, not having won a race yet Russell has managed to break that duck so we'll see if there's many more for him to come but a phenomenal drive apart from the qualifying but less about that the better but otherwise an excellent drive for a great result for him and Mercedes absolutely and you felt that both George Russell and the constructor of Mercedes really earned this win didn't they and did it in style with not only the the P1 but P2 as well and they were above really a Red Bull and the Ferraris which were behind me yes they were helped really by the penalties to Sainz for example and the damage afflicted to Verstappen but you felt that Mercedes were building towards a victory either at the start of next season or the end of this one because looking back at Lewis Hamilton over the last three races for example he's got back-to-back uh, p2s from all the way of austin to mexico and then also sao paulo as well and there's been a few sort of chances or opportunities before that as well singapore and we mentioned zanvor as well but um i was not expecting them to to get this despite them doing so well and you know having such a momentous start owing to the sprint which let's be fair helped them significantly i think when it comes to the sprint races we once again see the faster cars uh being helped by that situation versus the more traditional um style of how things are done but I often make bold, brash predictions, and they sometimes come out well and sometimes don't. Cough, cough, Ferrari. Um, But I feel that Mercedes are back for next season because look at how effectively they've developed and how quickly they've developed their no-pods design, which, let's be fair, at the start of the season they were third but stranded, closer perhaps to the midfield than Red Bull and Ferrari. But now here they are having those upgrades uh, in Austin, I believe, and now they're on a level where they can take the fight to Red Bull, beat Red Bull, Bull, um, pound for pound if you're looking at the sprint for example hold one of them off and also hold off the Ferraris as well, you know, miles away from where they were at the start of this very season, you think, well if this is what they can do in the short periods and the confines of a season where they can't overhaul the entire design of a car imagine what they can do now they've realised about the new regulations and realised what they can and can't do to create a successful uh, sort of power unit I suppose and also um, apparatus and all round package moving forwards there, so um exciting to see i didn't expect them to to get that p1 but here they are doing that and going into the final race it's going to be quite an exciting one for mercedes with the momentum versus a more sort of floundering ferrari because now it's 19 points between mercedes and ferrari and between signs and hamilton that's six points so the fight is on and in my view ferrari have to win this not only for money purposes and funding moving forwards and win tunnel time but also reputationally as well because they were in a two horse fight if you will no pun intended with red bull at the start of the season they looked unstoppable they had the package which i dubbed bulletproof and many others followed as well but now they could finish third despite being in a two horse race which would be frankly devastating really because their reputation has taken a damage already but to lose to mercedes after their desperate start would be quite incredible really but the reason they're in that position is owing to the man who won Uh, this race George Russell has been so consistent this season Mm. even with a more dodgy package versus the one which is flying now so I'm quite glad in a way that he won this race versus Hamilton no disrespect to him but Hamilton's won so many races in so many different conditions you know so many world championships as we forget as well but George Russell is one of those who's had to do it the long way around the more difficult way and he's um yeah very happy he won that and uh I felt if he didn't and was nabbed away at the last moment owing to the issues to his car or dare we say team orders that would have been quite a a, a cruel twist of fate once again for him because he's not had it easy at all well and just um, I just imagine really what would have been like if George Russell was at Mercedes last year Toto Wolff actually said (laughs) um 
this weekend that perhaps George has an, a, a year too many at Williams. And to be honest, I think the the plan would have, was to uh, grab George for for last year, but the contract was just so good at Williams. You know, he stayed on for a little bit longer, which I know was nice for Bottas, but ah, uh, kind of a think what would have been like if he was there as well last year whilst they were you know at their pinnacle. It would have certainly been very very interesting indeed the the nice thing about this race really tom as as uh, as you said is it it gave some some validation to the mercedes direction especially when throughout the season they have been you know they've been sort of top of the mid mid of the pack and if you saw the mercedes running in eighth place for example then it it didn't seem like they were out of position. It, it's you know I personally you know if you saw them in eighth, you know, yeah okay fair enough. Someone else having a pretty good day and you know George or Hamilton, you know they're eking everything they can out of it, but it's just not brilliant. Um, but I think th- this weekend gave them that that uplift that they needed. And of of more <laughs> Wolf quotes that I have um from this weekend. Uh, Wolf did say that the DNA of the car is going to be changing for 2023. He said, although the exterior of the car won't be looking that different, the DNA is going to be changing, especially as they have more wind tunnel time um, compared to uh, their rivals. Um, I, You know, that's direct to basically a Red Bull, I think, uh, given that Red Bull not only has a reduction of wind tunnel time, but also has a penalty of wind tunnel time as well, which, mm. you know, should even things up next year i think mercedes as you say the mercedes really this this weekend demonstrated what maybe they could be doing next year and we need we need a two horse race or if even better three horse race because it has mm. been absolutely frustrating to see ferrari unable to pick up the uh, the mantle and challenge red bull in a way that we perhaps liked and oddly enough with max out of the picture this weekend we actually <laughs> we got a bit of a taster of what this year could have been um and so that's a taste i uh, i've now got and would very much like that for next year um but i think to be honest i'm i'm almost slightly concerned now about next year if mercedes are on top form if they can get their act together a who would who do you think would be able to challenge the you know, the Red Bull? Uh, would you think it would be Hamilton or Russell, or both? Because that could have some significant consequences on the team. I think I don't. I have the opinion. I think that Mercedes are showing strengths, and you could argue. Some might argue that with Mercedes, the fact that they're showing this level of performance. At this current moment, you might think, despite their travails this year, you might think, oh, if they get their act together, they could be off in the distance again. I'm not so sure. I still think there's the possibility for there to be a really close battle next year. I think that Red Bull probably have the advantage at the moment in general, despite their off weekend and into Lagos. But overall, they still have the fastest car, and this wind tunnel uh, penalty dilapidation that they'll suffer from may well bring them back closer towards the other teams. I think that Mercedes, they're slowly getting their act together and that could also work as a good sign in terms of them competing at the front again or for the championship. Ferrari, who knows really. But the realistic hope for Ferrari is that we can hopefully see them put, get their act together a bit and put in those performances again. Those performances which were the first, well, the first maybe three, four races of the season made them look unbeatable. Um, which admittedly is not a long period, but at the same time, it was a period nonetheless. Now, whether that will be the case, we'll have to see. But I think that Mercedes is... I resist from calling it a resurgence because they've won one race this season, even in the second half of the season. But I still think that there's a possibility that we could have a really close battle next year with several teams at the front, several teams competing... And that's what I see from what's going on at the moment. I think that's it could be a very promising sign, Mercedes' competitiveness at the moment. Um, and it gives me hope, hope for the future, but it does give me hope that they can 
be up there next year and that we'll have a, t- a titanic battle who knows we may have Verstappen versus Hamilton again mm. um, the pretender not the pretender anymore because he's double world champion <laughs> versus the master um, which as we saw on Sunday no love lost there could get messy but um, but back to the original point I think that Mercedes's competitiveness wouldn't necessarily show them to be possibly going off into the distance but I think it does give us an opportunity to see whether there'll be a, a a closer battle next year and I think that could definitely be a possibility um, should things go as they're currently going. Yeah, and it's going to be really tricky as well for Mercedes if they are fully back in the title fight with Red Bull and or Ferrari as to, as Tristan hinted there, how they manage the inter-team relationship because previously it was Hamilton is the dominant driver and Bottas is the second driver. Bottas is allowed to win one or two races if that's compliant with Hamilton but he's mainly there to go and make sure that the team does well and Hamilton does well and... Let's be fair, he was brought in as a stopgap and then he became a rather good stopgap and he just sort of carried on being in the team because there was no one else ready until George Russell was and was able to get out of that Williams contract, as Tristan said earlier. So uh, they're going to have to do similar to what McLaren did with Button and Hamilton because they can't have George Russell as the second driver. He is the future of Mercedes. Hamilton, despite wanting a multi-year deal and going to get that, I believe anyway, Hamilton is reaching the end of his career, the end of his pinnacle, regardless of how well he's doing and how well someone like Alonso and indeed Raikkonen did when they got into their 40s. But they can't afford to alienate George Russell. They've got to give him decent treatment. So how do you do that? How do you keep both drivers happy, the rising star and the seven-time world champion? How do you keep them both happy while not allowing both drivers to have it all their one way or their way they want because they can't go and say Hamilton we're going to play it your way or Russell we're going to play it your way all the time because that just can't work and it's not going to work for anyone so who benefits from that arguably you want to say Red Bull do because yes we've seen a huge rift apparently break out between Verstappen and indeed Perez's teammate but it's quite clear the team is built around Verstappen it is team Verstappen um and he is going to be given, has been given, and will be given, I believe, the best kit, preferential treatment with strategy, and the like, not to mention he's in the ascendancy versus Perez not being in the ascendancy. So it's going to be quite a tightrope for Mercedes to to sort of tread, tread along, and in, that's without even getting onto the fact that Ferrari is still going to be in and around the, the top three, I believe. They've still got two very good drivers. I'm confident that their car will be decent in quality and have the ability to win races. So it's not going to be a a, a sort of done conclusion really come next season owing to this sort of one-off race, but it's quite clear to see in my eyes at least it's going to be far more competitive this season or season to come versus the season that's coming to a close now. Now imagine this, it's the latter stages of the Brazilian Grand Prix and for once this season it's not all going quite so well for Red Bull. Verstappen was in P6, he's collided with Lewis Hamilton and been slapped with a 5 second penalty. While Sergio Perez, his partner, as I said earlier, was down in P7 and was falling victim to Hamilton, the two Ferraris among others and also being forced to allow Verstappen to pass him to pass him at the start of the final 10 laps before the flag, which was following a safety car. Now, Verstappen was told um, by going into the last lap by his team that if he did not pass Alonso before the final corner, he should let Sergio Perez back past him before the end. Spoiler alert for those who didn't watch, listen, or indeed read about this Grand Prix, he did not. This prompted Perez to say afterwards, it really shows who he is over the team radio, and later saying via a Spanish or Mexican media, I believe, if he, he being Verstappen, has two titles, that's thanks to me. Now, Verstappen has said he had his reasons for what he did, and that these were motivated by something that happened in the past. Now, why is this important? Well, the actions of the two-time world champion deprive Sergio Perez of two points as he continues to seek to battle uh, Charles Leclerc for P2 in the Drivers' Championship, and there's one race to go, while Verstappen himself has, of course, won the championship three races prior. Now, Perez and Leclerc are tied on points going into the final race in the season, Abu Dhabi, that's coming this weekend, which means it's all to play for. So our thoughts on this then, is this more a sort of storm in a teacup or the beginning of yet another rift, another feud at Red Bull? And they've had a lot of those in the past, haven't they? Yep. Bull in name and beefy in nature. Um, as, I mean, welcome to F1 Conspiracies in Review. 
because there is more to this story i think than perhaps just this weekend because if you would like to believe um a certain group of fans uh, well and what seems to be an ever-growing group of fans um and I'll leave this judgment up to yourselves. I, I don't think it's a good idea to weigh in too much on whether all this, but I will highlight it. Um, supposedly, Perez purposely crashed in Monaco, and in doing so, red flagged the the qualifying. And the repercussions of that were that you get the you know track position. And supposedly, because this denied Max his opportunity to take pole, Max held a grudge against Perez and then said, you know, don't ever ask me to, to you know, help Perez. Um, I gave you my reasons. And supposedly that was the reason. Um, he didn't deny it during the Sky News uh, interview afterwards. Um, he said, oh, you let people make up their own minds. So, you know, I mean, let, let's face it. We, we, uh, personally, I choose not to believe that a, a driver, per, you know, chooses to crash, um, for their own gain. I, I find it a bit weird that he would choose to crash whilst in P three. Now, the the counterpoint to that, if you'd like to give it any weight, is well, Max was behind him, so actually he just got one up on Max. Which, yeah, it's true, but crashing an f1 car often means compromising your race because you have to change components you have to have uh potentially a new gearbox i mean look at charles leclerc when he crashed in monaco got pole position but failed to even start the race you know that th this it would be very very difficult to to do that and manage the crash in such a way that you would get off scot-free and then to continue that that line of thought even if even if you start tracking the telemetry, start tracking the throttle data, which I know some of you are because I've seen it, <laughs> right? You're not actually tracking the full data because you, you you haven't considered that humans are effectively fallible. Everyone keeps pointing at the telemetry data and be like, oh, well, you know, he stabs on the throttle there. Well, yeah, but I mean, he he's fallible. He's a human. He, he could not be paying attention. I mean, if you ask Perez, like if, if we got the truth out of him, the truth well could be I wasn't paying attention to what I was doing or something like that. We don't know. We have no idea what actually happened, nor will we, which is why the team would have discussed it with Perez and sorted this stuff out. And that's what's key to this problem is what Max did wasn't just overriding team orders okay because that is you know half of it the other half of what max did was effectively dig up all of the skeletons and you know bring them back mm. out and you know airing the dirty laundry of red bull in quite a public way and that's not something that red bull would look at very kindly because now the whole red bull brand is tarnished slightly max verstappen's brand is tarnished and sergio perez comes out of this looking quite good because mm. for whatever you uh you might you know might be saying about him he has done nothing but tried to help max when it mattered he tried to help max when it mattered in abby dabby and he made, you know, made the difference where it mattered throughout this season and crucially in Japan to help Max get his, his number one. Which means I think Max owed him. And even if he did accidentally crash or did you know, purposely crash in Monaco, the fact is the team would have sorted this out or should have sorted this out. I suspect thought they'd sorted this out. And Max decided to act like a petulant child. All because of something that may or may not have happened. And I don't think it helps that the public starts jumping on, on this bandwagon as well. As I say, I refuse to believe that someone like Sergio Perez would purposely crash to try and get third position at Monaco. It just doesn't seem like his character to me. Yeah, mm. strange incident, really. Strange incident. I think it sort of it links to the whole weekend as well, and that we sort of saw parts of the old Verstappen. This year we've very much seen not the uh, not a new Verstappen, but an improved Verstappen, where he's been calculated, cold, ruthless, but in a different way. 
Um, he's been really absolutely on it, and he's maybe been able to dis- dismiss his opposition really um, without much of a trace. And this weekend we saw, and I mean, we've I've said this before. Champions have off weekends every now and then. Hamilton has had the most. Hamilton in the past has had a blindingly good season to win the title, but there's just that one weekend in the year where he's just a bit rubbish and a bit average. And Verstappen has had a couple of those this year, um, but in in his defence, he has also won 14 races, so they haven't mattered too much. But this weekend was one of them. We had the the couple of things. We had the instant with Hamilton where. I don't know, from my point of view, it, every, some people were saying it was a racing incident. I'm not convinced. From what I saw, Verstappen did his classic thing. He seems to always do specifically with Hamilton, um, but not with Leclerc, of, there's a gap, I'm going there, if you're in the way, we crash. Um, and there have been times in the past where, for example, Imola last year, where they made a little contact at the start. Then you have Barcelona last year, where Verstappen went, I go in gap. If we hit, if you turn in, we crash. And Hamilton decided not to turn in, so they got lucky on that occasion. But he did that again this weekend. It was a bit. It reflected a bit of a scrappy one for Verstappen. I thought um, the pace of the Red Bull wasn't there as much, admittedly, but he then took the scrappiness to another level with that instant in the race. And then what happened at the end between him and Perez? Now, in my opinion, I think that yeah, he's he's absolutely. Like, I, I don't know why he's if if there is a grudge there we can't say for sure but if there is a grudge there unusual one wouldn't surprise me if someone as fiercely competitive or driven as Verstappen held a grudge in that situation because that's that there, there's a history realistically in Formula 1 of champions and I think Hamilton's perhaps the only exception which is why I personally consider him at the top of the, the list of greats is because Hamilton was one who his wheel to wheel combat and racing and fairness to his teammate has generally been better than the most. Schumacher used to turn in on people. He turned in on people to win the world championship on one occasion, and he didn't get away with it the second time. Verstappen is very, very aggressive in his fighting and has a sort of a I don't care attitude if it ends up in a in a racing instance. Um, Ayrton Senna used to him and Prost used to go hammer and tongs to each other. And Senna would come out on top and his famous quote, if you don't go for a gap, you're not a racing driver. But that would translate into even a small gap, he would just go for it. And Verstappen has that sort of mentality, I think, where he just, he's very driven, but it takes it's the, it takes him to the point of having a grudge like he did this weekend and being so, there's being like driven and focused on what you want, right? But there is, then then people like him, like Schumacher used to, like Senna used to take it to another level, and it's something we I think we have to bear in mind when we look at how great these drivers are. And for sure, I look at someone like Michael Schumacher, and he was he was just before my time. I only saw him in Formula One when he came back in his forties. But from the videos and highlights I've seen from his peak, he was he was unbelievable. He was an unbelievable driver. But there's always that thing of that time when he turned into Damon Hill. And effectively won the championship, whether deliberate or not, we don't know. That time in Monaco all those years ago, when he um, he was on pole, provisional pole in Q3, and then he um, went a bit too fast round the last corner at Monaco, slowed it down enough so he parked it, and then there's a red flag, and then he got mm-hmm. thrown to the back of the grid for that. And sh- some champions have that kind of thing. Of a stop and that uh, that I don't want to call it an ugly side, but that sort of that side was like reared its head this weekend. But I think realistically, I can only see this going one way. And I ref- again, I talk about history repeating itself. Remember that time when Sebastian Vettel and Mark Webber were battling for the lead in Malaysia, multi-21 and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, and Vettel was told not to pass Webber. He did anyway. And then after the race, Red Bull supported Vettel, even though he had disobeyed the team instruction. And then it kind of, that was that. It never never really came out again after that. So I can only see this going one way. I can see this ending up with Perez not necessarily publicly rolling back his comments, but maybe privately, and then the whole team moving on from this and Verstappen taking up the mantle as lead driver again. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if that was an outcome from this. Um, <coughs> for, su- for something which realistically was incredibly petty, I think, in terms of the context of what it was, um, it was over sixth place behind an Alpine. Mm-hmm. 
and did it need to turn into did it need to become something big whoever initiated it being that big whether whether it was whether it looks like it was verstappen or not it didn't need to be that big really so yeah it's a it's a strange one a strange one to uh, i i think tarnish is a strong word but, but i don't think it's done much help to verstappen but at the same time there'll be people who there are people who idolize him and he could do anything and they would still idolize him so for some people this won't change a thing but it's um, an interesting subplot from the weekend definitely most definitely and it does leave a sort of bitter taste in the mouth really and I think looking at Verstappen this race he seemed really rattled as you both alluded to there and I'm trying to think why he was rattled what was he rattled by but the only thing I can think about is first of all George Russell doing so well in the sprint Mercedes being resurgent in only a relative form, if you will, in this uh, weekend, because we know that he has a strong dislike for Mercedes and Lewis Hamilton, going back to the fact that I believe he was rejected by the constructor when he was a young lad and taken up by Red Bull and everything's gone racy for him, etc. But we know he's got a personal dislike that goes beyond just racing for Mercedes versus someone like McLaren, Ferrari, Alpine, for example. So maybe that is what rattled him, but we saw... As we say there, a, a Verstappen, he was willing to dig up old skeletons for no reason and really sort of die on hills that he didn't need to die on, really, because you say what you will about Hamilton and Schumacher insofar as they were clearly the number one drivers in their team. Bottas was Hamilton's number two driver, as I said before, and Barrichello was Schumacher's uh, number two, I believe, anyway. Likewise, I didn't really watch many races of the Schumacher era. I was too young, but we can see by the history books and videos of prior, that's how it was. But they were both very coy so far as they knew they had to go and keep their teammates happy. That's, you know, letting Bottas win certain races, letting Barrichello win certain races, not always having it their own way. And this is where I think... Verstappen's been quite naive in his his attitude and what he's done here because the World Championship has been sewn up for him three races prior. He's a double-time World Champion. There is no way that the FIA are going to take that away from him owing to the cost cap infringement. They said that themselves. Um, and that's done and dusted. It's moving on now to the next season. We're coming to the closing stages of what has been an excellent season for both Verstappen and also for Red Bull. And we look at someone like Sergio Perez and look back at how he was with Racing Point and Force India and it's quite clear that when he has a grudge or a bone to pick with a certain team that he doesn't like, he's willing to get his elbows out, be that at the press conferences and also on track as well. Look at how ferociously he fought as Ocon, for example. I mean, the fact that they both sort of went there in separate ways is telling really to the fact that their relationship was combustible and did combust really and we could see something similar with Perez and Verstappen because we look at someone like Perez and not only with his track record and his desire to go and fight for everything he's got into the Red Bull team of course owing to hard work tenacity and the like owing to the fact that you know, previously for a short period at least he was without a seat in Formula One He's now in the latter stages of his career, sort of 32 years old, I believe, so it's not like he has to go and not make any enemies moving forwards because the window is closing. There's only, let's say, four, five, three years left of his Formula 1 peak career. And his contract at Red Bull ends at the end of 2024. Now, I think that's the natural end for the Perez-Red Bull relationship. You know, he'll be 34, 35 years old at that time. I don't think that's going to be renewed. So... What is the incentive for Sergio Perez to be the nice guy moving forwards? What is the incentive for him to be the good guy, the legend, the mate, as Verstappen called him on numerous occasions when he did what he wanted? What is the incentive there for Sergio Perez? Because he signed himself down for the next two years. He's going to be in a very decent car, maybe, OK, not the dominant car this year, but certainly a very competitive one where he can get himself up to you know, P2, P3, even win certain races if everything goes correctly for him and indeed for Red Bull. So what is the incentive for Perez to go and play Team Red Bull, Team Max and not Team Perez? Because I can't really see one and I think that this could be quite worrying really for Max Verstappen because if things don't cool down then you could see a combustible relationship in Red Bull. Again we saw how even Verstappen and Ricardo weren't really eye to eye at times. That's kind of the reason really why Ricardo left Red Bull, we're to believe, from the Drive to Survive series. We've seen as well 
as you mentioned there, Vettel and Webber not getting on as well. So there is precedence there. There is precedence, and there should be reason to be worried if your team acts. So yeah, a very silly move, and he's not really gained anything from it. Well, this is what I think Max doesn't really understand is that that he does not make the team. The team makes him. I would very much like to see Max Verstappen win a world championship if he had to get out the car and change the tyres himself. Remind me again what Max Verstappen's qualification on fluid dynamics or you know, mechanical engineering is. The reality is, yes, he's an incredibly talented driver and he does get that thing around the, the, the track very, very quickly. But he is actually you know, just a larger cog in what is an almighty machine behind him. And if I was I was Christian Horner, I would go out of my way to remind him that without Red Bull, he has no championships future or past. And I do think that Max Verstappen's petulant attitude will lose him the world championships. I mean, crikey, they nearly lost him last last year's world championship. If he hadn't of, of crashed out with, for example, Lewis Hamilton, you know, he would have been in a much stronger position in the final race of the year. And yes, things went his way. You cannot count on luck. And I think it's really sad that perhaps, you know, that the level of, of, of Max Verstappen hasn't quite reached the, 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 the pinnacle yet because he's still got this, I'm not sure, it's a slightly malicious nature to him. And it is malicious. You know, he knew what he was doing, not letting Sergio through. He did it on purpose. That's malicious. Doing something on purpose, you know, to cause harm. And for for Checo, it really means a lot to him to get second place. So I do think that perhaps next year, if it's a closer fight, then Perez could, you know, could look at him and go, well, I'm not going to help you. And that that's OK. You know, I'm OK with that simply because it, we're not a team anymore. It's not the the Max Perez duo, the I scratch your back, you scratch mine sort of thing. If it's if if Max really wants it to be completely independent, then I think we'll get a far more passive Perez when it comes to assisting a teammate. And I think that could cost Max the championship, especially if we've got Hamilton, Russell, and heaven forbid the Ferraris also challenging for points. There's a, there's always a possibility of reading too much into this, but then also <laughs> the way the world is, the world is always reading too much in, or reading into things. So, and uh, that's sort of, that ends up being the way it is. And we could literally, yeah, be blowing this way out of proportion. I think one thing to add is that if you get a situation where Perez is not cooperating in the championship as much with Max. I think that contract is going to end a year early, personally, because we know how much control Max has in that team overall. Um, and I think the fact that Perez has been so um, helpful in the pursuit of the championships last year and also this year, I think that almost that works well in Perez's favour, for sure, because it means he can actually back up his speed with results and can bring home points in the constructors. But it also leaves Red Bull saying to him, well, Checo, you did this two years ago, so why are you not doing it now, mate? Why are you not doing it? You know, I thought we, I thought we, uh, thought we worked, we worked well together this way. So, I think that, yeah, as I referred to my point earlier, I think I can see this going one way. I see it being Perez being put back in line and made to follow the the Red Bull, uh, the Red Bull party line, etc. But um, at the same time, this could just be a, a minor squabble, which is which is just left to rest over the winter and they come back and they're all happy again i could see it being that so um yeah we'll have to see really but it's uh yeah nice li- nice little story isn't it we can uh i'm sure we'll take a prime spot in drive to survive as well perhaps yeah hopefully they've got the mics on don't you think though perez has them vulnerable though and and i was contemplating that exact fact on sunday angus because i you know i agree with you that surely Red Bull will be able to turn around and say, well, you know, fine, <laughs> you're going to play ball. Well, off you go, off you trot. Go, good luck getting another drive. But the reality is Red Bull is very vulnerable. Mm. And Perez knows this because what yeah. happened when Ricardo left the team and as, as a strong driver, they went into limbo. They went through Alex Albon and Pierre Gasly 
they that lost them serious points and they were nowhere near the constructors so if perez says yeah fine then you know kick me out leave who replaces him because either you bring in a young hungry driver who wants to challenge max Nick DeVries. yeah exactly no. a young hungry driver that wants to challenge mm. max but in nick de do you think I, I think I don't think it would work. Red Bull need a driver that's happy to play second fiddle. Mm-hmm. And that's hard to get. Not only do they need a driver that can play for second fiddle, but they also need a driver that is very good. So who can hold their own if, for you know, Max decides to crash out. Sergio Perez is that complete package. Now, the, the you know, I would say someone like Daniel Ricciardo, if, you know, that... Um, but Daniel Ricciardo's form huh. hasn't been quite as good as we had liked. But let's face it: if Nick De Vries got into Red Bull, he'd be he'd be wanting to challenge. He wouldn't want to be sitting back, you know, taking team orders, letting Max pass, surely. And so I think personally, Red Bull's in a really difficult situation because they've got exactly what they want. They've got their perfect prime driver, and they've got a driver who's willing to support the prime driver. But if you lose your support, that's it. That They lose their confidence going into the next season. They have to spend another season getting a driver up to speed. They have to hope they're good enough. And what happens if they're not? So surely Perez has got them kind of pinned. And which is why, perhaps, I think on this occasion, Red Bull isn't likely to come out in defence of Max and is likely to take a very hard line with Max. Actually, because they know that without Perez they risk future championships. And I think the Red Bull have to move heaven and earth in the upcoming finale, the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix, because they're tied on points between Perez and Leclerc. And we saw how well Leclerc did in adverse circumstances to get himself right up towards the top of the pack here. So we may joke and laugh about Ferrari's strategy and ha ha ha, they can't possibly get anything right. I'm not too sure, I'm not too confident about that because they're showing, while they may be down on performance versus um versus Mercedes and Red Bull, they are able to go and battle through adversity and do rather well. And just think how devastating it could be or would be if Sergio Perez doesn't get that P2 position in the Constructors, which was, let's be fair, gift-wrapped to him by the Red Bull guy he has, by the lack of performance that Mercedes had towards the start of the season, and by Ferrari just not being able to put together uh, a, a vast array of decent races and performances. So I think this will go down to the fact that whatever happens at the weekend will determine the future relationship between Perez, Red Bull and Verstappen. Because if they don't do what Perez wants in this scenario if we see once again Verstappen saying well sorry I'm not going to do what you want Perez because back in 2020 when you're at racing points you touch my wheel then you can see quite a combustible relationship next year and the pipeline as you say is drying up who is there Liam Lawson Yuki Tsunoda I'm not even convinced that Nick De Vries would be ready for the Red Bull team or the second seat. I don't think there's anything to say that he'd do what Pierre Gasly didn't do or what Alex Albon didn't do themselves. So, yes, um, quite a delicate situation, I feel, for Christian Horner et al. So let's talk about Kevin this weekend. We saw the use of the sprint format for the third and final time. And this saw uh, Hass's Kevin Magnussen top the timesheet on the Friday qualifying ahead of Verstappen and George Russell. But regrettably, as part of the sprint, the Dane fell to P8. But a remarkable achievement to top the timesheet on Friday nonetheless, even if he was helped by rain, a red flag, triggered by the man who would go on to win this race. So whether you like it or not, we're going to have to double the amount of sprint races next season. There'll be six. But first and foremost, what's our thoughts on Kevin Magnussen getting that P1 on Friday? I would have never have believed it. Oh, brilliant. Absolutely incredible. If you, uh, Kevin Magnussen, I mean, crikey, it was one hell of a, a qualifying due to the changing weather conditions. But to be honest, who would have thought that, that Haas would be able to get more pole positions this year the Mercedes, and I know what you're going to say, well, actually, uh, Mercedes got cold pole position because they won the sprint race on Saturday. And if this was last year, I think, then you would have been correct. However, they changed the rules and the rules of the sprint say that whoever takes the, the qualifying, which in this case was on Friday, technically gets pole position. OK, 
I know it's a bit weird, but that's what's happening. So on the technicalities of pole position, Haas won Mercedes nil, which is fantastic and great for Haas <laughs> as well because they've just got their their new sponsors, giving them some time. You know, Magnussen gave a really heartfelt um, interview afterwards where he thanked his family. And to be honest, it was just a bit of a shake-up than the usual, oh, yeah, I'm in the fastest car and I think I uh, managed to get it around the track really fast, which is unfortunately what a lot of the other drivers sort of interview like. So it was nice to see some proper emotion from the team and, and just see something a little bit magic. Uh, it is up there, I think, with some of the my favourite F1 moments of all time actually i must admit i was a little bit taken aback by it by uh, Sat- uh sorry friday and just how emotional i think it, it was for a lot of the uh, a lot of the people on paddock um and even if you say it was a fluke you know you make your own luck and has managed to get kevin magnuson out on the slick tires to to get a lap time that no one else could, could produce which if that's not what qualifying's all about then I don't know what is. So good on good on Magnussen, really. And yes, I know he ended up being in P8 um, by the time we'd finished the sprint. But again, can't really fault him for that because there are seven much, much, much quicker cars to him. He not only let the lap um, in, in the sprint, but he also had an amazing start as well. So didn't put a foot wrong, really. Brought home an extra point for Haas. Um, and so... I just, I, I was such, a, it was such a shame that he managed to um, provide instant karma to to Ricardo in the um, actual race because he got tagged by Ricardo, spun round, and then managed to smash Ricardo um, and take them <laughs> both out. But to be honest, instant karma. Um, so yeah, it was just a real amazing moment, and I hope we see some more from Haas going forward. Yeah, you know what? Moments like this, I love it. I love it. For it's what Formula One's about. There's just shock results, which. You know what thing is? They're they're better when they are rarer because then you really do appreciate shock results. But I I was rubbing my eyes on that Friday night. I couldn't believe it. Kevin Magnussen in a Haas on pole. That's like phenomenal. And just little things like um, Gunter Steiner's reaction, his interview afterwards was gold. His quote, which will stick with me for a long time. Something along the lines of, um, when it rains soup, you've got to have your spoon ready. Um, <laughs> unbelievable, <laughs> unbelievable quote. As well as saying, we may have naysayers, but welcome to our pole position, the naysayers. So, <laughs> like, it produced gold moments like that. But also for Haas, a team which, they're a bit of a, I don't want to say an anomaly on the grid, but you've got teams which are big manufacturers or drinks companies or, um, like, linked to a like an affiliate to a larger team and then you got Haas who are sort of one of the old style teams a privateer um funded by someone's own pocket Gene Haas's pocket um a real sort of plucky underdog um who hasn't who's not even stood on a formula 1 podium uh, in their time in the sport in their 7 years so for them to get a pole position in that time is an absolutely phenomenal achievement and for a team which this time last year was licking its wounds, sitting on zero points with two rookie drivers after a tough season. Um, for them to finish a season, admittedly, they probably would have wanted to finish higher in the constructors, and they may still, you never know. Um, they look set for eighth or ninth at the moment, but for them to get a pole position is phenomenal. The storyline about Magnussen is phenomenal because, of course, he was not looking at a seat for this year before the drama of um, Mazepin's departure led to a seat opening and Magnussen has filled that role brilliantly. He's done a stunning job, I think. He's driven fantastically from that fifth place in Bahrain to other drives, putting um, showing Mick Schumacher the way as well. And then this unbelievable pole position, um, which ended in a sad way on Sunday. But I think the pole position is something to him to be really, really proud of. Um, and it shows we need... It's nice to have these results in Formula 1. I was just doing a little bit of research just quickly, uh, just now. And between uh, middle of 2014 and 2019, a pole position was not taken by anyone outside of Mercedes, Red Bull and Ferrari in those five and a half years. Wow. But in the last three years, we've had we've still had that, that, that pattern of poles in those teams. But we've had brilliant sessions like remember when Lance Stroll got pole in the wet in Turkey mm-hmm. or roughly this time last year when Lando Norris got that pole. There was that grid in um, 
in in uh, the Russian Grand Prix, which was like the f- the top three was Norris, Sainz, Russell, and then Stroll in fourth. It's shock results like that where Magnussen can steal a pole, even with a bit of luck with George Russell's off causing that red flag. It's moments like that which make you fall in love with the sport, and I thought it was absolutely brilliant to see. Um, and just the pure emotion of it from Steiner's interview to Magnussen when he realised he had pole standing on his standing on the front wing of his car and just jumping up and down in pure delight the Haas mechanics just ecstatic it was oh it was brilliant absolutely quality 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 stuff and yeah they no matter what no matter the fact they only went away from the weekend with Magnussen's one point from the sprint it's um a weekend to remember for the ages and the day before Gene Haas's 70th birthday as well as if you mm. couldn't write it. Yeah, I was quite surprised when Haas got into Q3, but P1 is a completely different animal planet and unit, isn't it? And how remarkable as well for them to not only get that, but also two valuable points from the sprint. The sprint coming into its own there for Haas. And ultimately that could be a decider because there's now two points between them and Alpha Tauri who got one race left in eighth place. I think let's be fair, them getting seventh is out of the question. So eighth is quite a good position to finish in when you consider the turmoil at the start of the season. Mazepin leaving, Urakali, the biggest sponsor of the team, leaving as well. Also them not fielding both cars in the Saudi Arabian Grand Grand Prix, for example, bringing back one of their drivers. I mean, it's quite remarkable that the the fact that Magnussen wasn't in the sport last year, that yet this year he's getting himself a P1 in qualifying is quite remarkable. You know, he was the future once. He was dumped from Haas, being dubbed as not good enough, and then it is someone else, someone fresher, someone newer someone who had age on their side, hunger, ambition, etc., to go and uh, get the wheels turning of Haas in this new era. But no, they've gone back to the old tried and tested and it's worked out pretty well for them. And it's seen as well how well or how correct they were, how vindicated they've been to go and get Magnussen back, granted at short notice, but credit to him for keeping himself fit and for ultimately not letting bygones be bygones and um, taking the non-Verstappen route of burying the hatchet and going... You know, fair enough, there was bad blood in the past, but I'm willing to come back, not only for myself, but also the team as well, really. So, a shame how things ended on Sunday, but uh, congratulations to both Magnussen and Haas, really. It shows that on their day, Haas can get themselves some remarkable points, can do rather well, can battle with some of the best because, yes, he did fall down to P8, but it wasn't like, let's say, a Williams being up there or an Alpha Tauri being up there or many of the other slower units we've seen in times gone by being up there. It was you know, a few fights there from Kevin Magnussen and credit to him there. We're seeing really why he was given the chance with McLaren right at the start of his career, for example, why he's been brought back and um, why he's held in such high regard. So congratulations to him and um, hopefully this is the uh, beginning of things to come whether that's with uh, Schumacher, Mick Schumacher by his side or indeed Nico Hulkenberg which the rumours continue to say Hulkenberg will be announced on Wednesday so we are recording this on Tuesday so if you're listening to this live on River Radio or via your podcast provider of choice and it's been announced then congratulations I guess to him and it's not been then hard luck old sport well done Schumacher and it seems that's all we've got time for in terms of episode 38 of F1 in Review. Thank you very much for listening all the way to the end of this one, where we look back at the Brazilian Grand Prix, be that by your preferred podcast provider, your Apple Podcast Musics, uh, Spotify, Podfollow, and the rest, or via listening to this via River Radio, be that live or via the Listen Back feature. Thank you very much for joining us all the way to the end of this hour. A reminder that you can follow myself, Tristan, and the F1 in Review account uh, on Twitter. The handle for the F1 in Review account is just that. All one word, obviously, no hyphens, no dashes, no backstrokes or forward strokes, just F1 in Review, capital F. And as we said there, the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix, the finale of this season, is next this weekend. Indeed, qualifying is back at its normal day of Saturday. It starts at 2pm, this being if you're watching or indeed 
indeed listening in the UK. And the race is, of course, on Sunday starting 1pm. Once again, that is UK time as well. So we look forward to being back next week discussing the finale of this season, one where Max Verstappen has dominated but perhaps made a rod for his own back moving forwards. We'll catch you next week and we look forward to discussing this and everything else that's come from this Grand Prix, the winners and the losers and everyone in between. See you later. Thank you.